Hello everyone, my name is Ariel Noff and I will present a paper Efficient Fully Secure Computation via Distributed Zero Knowledge Proofs. This is a joint work with Alet Boyle, Nim Gilbo and Yuval Ishai. So in multi-party computation, we have n parties who wish to compute jointly some functionality over their inputs without revealing anything but the output. This computation should be carried out in the presence of an adversary and there are usually two main types of adversaries that we consider. Semi-honest, where the adversary follows the protocol but may try to learn more than allowed, and malicious, where the adversary may behave in any arbitrary manner. When considering malicious security, there are usually two main types of security guarantees that, that are considered. The first is security with a boat, when the where the adversary is allowed to mount a denial of service attack and prevent the parties from receiving their output, and full security, where the output is guaranteed to be delivered. And we know that in general, this can be achieved only in the honest majority setting, which we consider in this work. Now, a basic fundamental question in the field of MPC is, can we close the gap between semi-honest and malicious security? Or in other words, can we achieve full malicious security with the same amortized communication cost as for semi-honest and without giving up on concrete efficiency, which in this work is interpreted as using only cheap symmetric crypto such as a black box use of any PLG. So in this work, we have two results. The first result is a protocol for malicious security with a boat with the same amortized communication cost as for semi-honest. This protocol is for arbitrary number of parties. It works uh, on, over both fields and rings and with any linear secret sharing. <coughs> The second result is a protocol for full malicious security with the same amortized communication cost as for semi honest. This protocol is only for constant number of parties because it is based on replicated secret sharing, and in this scheme, the size of the share grows exponentially with the number of parties. Now, if we uh, instantiate the underlying semi honest protocol in, in both these protocols with the best semi honest protocol that are out there, we obtain maliciously secured protocol where each party is required to send less than 1.5 ring elements per multiplication bit. Now, we are not the, the only one who have uh, who had similar results recently. There has been other papers with similar results, so I want now to explain the differences between our protocol and their protocols. So, for security with a boat, uh, there are two relevant papers. The paper of Bonetal from Crypto19 and the paper of Goyal and Song uh, from this year. As you can see in this table, our protocol and the protocol of Bonetal work for, over both fields and rings, whereas the protocol of Goyal and Song works over fields. Our protocol and the protocol of Goyal and Song works with arbitrary number of parties, whereas the protocol of Bonetal works for constant number of parties. If we look at the communication cost additive term, which is the communication cost which is added when moving from semi-honest to malicious security, then in all three papers, uh, this additive term is sublinear in the size of the circuit. However, in our work and in the work of Royal and Song, it is logarithmic in the size of the circuit, and in Bonnet Hall, it is square root of the size of the circuit. And if we look at the number of rounds which is added when moving from semi-honest to malicious security, then in our work and in the work of Bonnet et al, it is constant, and in the work of Goyal and Song, it is logarithmic in the size of the circuit. So as you, as you can see from this table, we achieved the best of both papers and the best result in all four categories. So for full security, there is one relevant paper, the paper of another paper of Goyal et al from uh, this year. As you can see, uh, our work has the advantage of working over both fields and rings, and that the communication cost matches the best semi-honest protocol in our setting, which, which allows use of a PRG. On the other hand, uh, the protocol of Gial et al has an advantage over our protocol uh, in allowing arbitrary number of parties. On the other hand, their amortized communication cost does not match the best semi-honest protocol in their setting, which is information theoretic. In particular, they require two field elements uh, beyond the cost of the semi-honest protocol when cheating occurs. So I hope this uh, clarifies the differences between our result and other previous results.
So now let's move to our uh, solution. So the high-level approach of, of our protocol works in the following way. The parties start by sharing their inputs. Then they run a, a, a protocol to compute an arithmetic circuit. This protocol is only private in the presence of malicious adversary. It does not guarantee correctness. And therefore, the parties uh, then run a verification step to verify the correctness of the computation. And this step should be very cheap and fast, so its cost will be amortized away. And if this step uh, passes uh, successfully, then the parties proceed to reveal the output. Uh, so let's focus now on uh, the verification protocol, which is the main contribution of our paper. So our verification protocol relies on a tool which is called Distributed Zero Knowledge Proofs, a tool which was introduced by Bonnet al. And in this setting, we have one prover and several verifiers. And the prover wants to prove uh, that uh, given some input X that it holds, uh, then, for example, if we compute a circuit C over this input, then the output will be zero. And the idea is that the input, the input X is held in a dis distributed manner across the, the verifiers, which in this work is translated to X being being secret shared among the parties. And what Bonnet et al. showed was that if the uh, circuit C is a degree to circuit, and if X is robustly shared among the parties, which means that the shares of the, un of the honest parties alone is, are sufficient to compute all the other shares. So if these two conditions hold, then we can have a proof with size that is, that is sublinear in the size of the circuit. So how can we use this tool to verify the correctness of a computation? So in our verification protocol, the parties hold many triples, where each triple corresponds to one multiplication gate, and the parties hold a robust secret sharing of the inputs, of the two inputs, and the output of this gate, and they want to verify that all these triples are correct multiplication triples. And there are two approaches of how to use the Cebuti Zero Knowledge Proofs to achieve this goal. In the first approach, which we call the single prover approach, the parties, each party is required to prove that it acted honestly in the multiplication protocol to compute each of these triples. Or in other words, each party is required to prove that it sent the correct messages in the multiplication protocol. This approach was used to achieve three-party computation with a bot in Bonetal and was later uh, extended to full security by Boiletal. The problem with this approach is that it is not clear how to extend it to more than three parties. Uh, specifically, in order for this approach to work, we need all messages in the, uh, multi in the multiplication protocol to be a degree to function of robustly shared inputs. This holds for the three-party protocol that was used in, this, in these papers, but not uh, in general for protocols uh, for more than three parties. So because of this problem, a second approach was uh, proposed, which we call the multi-prover approach. And in this approach, the parties jointly prove that the sharing they hold on the output of each uh, multiplication gate is the correct, uh, is a sharing of the correct value given the inputs. And this approach was used by Bonental to achieve multi-party computation with a bot for constant number of parties. The problem with this approach is that it is not clear how to extend it to full security. Uh, specifically, when, when moving to full security, we need some mechanism, as we will see, to identify cheaters. Now, in the single prover approach, in each proof, we have one prover who knows all the information, and we can use it to identify cheaters. In the multi-prover approach, there is no such a prover, and it's, it is not clear how to identify cheaters. So the question of achieving uh, full security uh, for more than three parties uh, remains a challenge. And in order to overcome this challenge, we combine these two approaches in the following way. So our verification protocol starts with the multi-prover approach, where the parties want to prove that the sharing that they hold on each output of each multiplication gate is the correct sharing. And what we want the parties to do is to compute a linear combination of the difference between the output and the two 
and the multiplication of the two inputs. We denote this value by v. So what we want to do is to check whether v equals to zero or not. If v equals to zero, then we know with high probability that all the triples are correct. If v does, does not equal to zero, then the parties know that at least one triple is incorrect and they will reject, um, they will output reject at the end of the verification protocol. So our main, our first observ observation um, towards achieving this is that the parties can locally compute an additive sharing of V. Why is this true? So for example, uh, let's look on Shamir secret sharing. If the parties hold a Shamir secret sharing of X and Y with degree T, they, they can multiply it together and obtain, multiply it locally and obtain a degree 2T sharing of X times Y. And if they subtract it from a degree to degree t sharing of z, then they will obtain a degree 2t sharing of z minus x, x times y. And in the honest majority setting, we can co convert this 2t degree sharing using Lagrange, Lagrange coefficients to an additive sharing of the result. Uh, and this, this holds for other uh, secret sharing in the honest majority setting as well. And therefore, the parties can locally compute an additive sharing of v. However, this is of course still not enough. The parties cannot simply open this additive sharing because it is not robust and the, on, and the corrupted parties can open it to any other value they want. So what we will ask the parties to do is to first secret share their additive sharing. And then once each party holds an additive sharing, uh, a robust secret sharing of each additive sharing, they can sum it together and then they obtain a robust secret sharing of V, then they can open it. And now since the secret sharing is robust, the corrupted parties cannot cheat and open it to any other value but the correct value of V. However, this protocol is still not secure because in step two, a corrupted party may cheat and secret share a different value, not its actual additive sharing VI. Here is where we use the single prover approach uh, to distributed zero-knowledge zero proofs. How do we do it? So, if we look at the computation each party uh, does in order to compute its additive sharing, then each party use, uses its shares of X, Y, and Z. Now X, Y, and Z are robustly shared among the parties. However, if we have a robust secret sharing of X, we have also a robust secret sharing of each share of X. Why is this true? So again, if we look at Shamir secret sharing, if the parties hold a robust secret sharing of the value encoded at the point zero of the polynomial, then they also hold a robust secret sharing of the point, held, of the point on any other uh, of, the, of the value on any, on any other point on the polynomial. So the parties hold also a robust secret sharing of each share of x, y, and z. Now the computation that each party performed is also a degree two computation. So eventually what we have here is a degree two computation over inputs that are robustly shared across the parties. And here is exactly where we can use the single, the single prover distributed zero knowledge proof, uh, zero knowledge proof to verify the correctness of this computation. So going back to our verification protocol, we will add one more step where each party proves that it shared the correct value using the single prover distributed, distributed zero knowledge proof. Now, if this step uh, passes successfully and all the uh, proofs were accepted, then the parties know that they hold the correct secret sharing of all the additive sharings and in step four they can sum it together and they know that, that they hold a correct robust secret sharing of v. So this is our verification with abort protocol. Now let's look at the cost of this protocol. So the first step is a local computation. In the second step each party secret shares one value and so the cost is, is constant. In the third step, we run the, the zero knowledge proof, and here we have a cost which is logarithmic in the number of triples to verify. And in the last step, the parties open one value, and so again, the cost is constant. If we look at the number of rounds, so uh, to share uh, one secret, the parties need only 
constant number of rounds. We can run the zero knowledge proof with constant, stand, with constant number of rounds using the Fiat Chamber transform. And finally, to open uh, a secret sharing uh, or one value, then we also need the constant number of rounds. And so overall, we obtain a verification protocol where the communication cost is logarithmic in the number of, in the number of verified triples and the number of rounds is constant. So this is our verification with the protocol. Now let's see how we obtain uh, full security. So in order to achieve full security, we use the player elimination framework uh, where uh, the circuit is divided into segments and each segment is evaluated separately. It, which means that at the end of each segment, the parties run the verification protocol and if uh, the verification uh, succeeds, then the parties proceed to the next segment. Otherwise, what we want the parties to do is to find a semi-corrupt pair, which is a pair of parties such that one of them is guaranteed to be corrupt. And then the parties will remove this pair and recompute the segment with less parties. So in order to achieve full secu security, we have two uh, things that we need to show. First is how to find a semi-corrupt pair. And second, how to remove this pair in a secure way. So let's start with the first task of finding a semi-corrupt pair. And here we use uh, two properties which are unique to replicated secret sharing. And this is why our fully secure protocol works only with this secret sharing scheme. So the first uh, uh, property uh, is called pairwise inconsistency which means that if we have a sharing that is inconsistent, this implies that there is a conflict between two parties and we can use this conflict to obtain a semi-corrupt pair. For example, if we look at this, uh, at a three-party secret sharing with one corruption, then each share is held by two parties. And X3, for example, is held by P1 and P3. And so one way to have an inconsistency is to have a conflict between P1 and P3, where each party claims to hold a different value for X3. And we can use this conflict to find a semi-corrupt pair. The second property is in the distributed zero-knowledge proof, or more accurately, in the single prover distributed zero-knowledge proof. And when using replicated secret sharing, uh, we claim that all the inputs to each proof are known to the prover. Why is this true? So again, if we look at our two example, and let's say that P1 is the prover and P2 and P3 are the verifiers. So P1 wants to prove that it performed some computation over its, its inputs, which are X1 and X3. And X2 is basically, is not relevant to this computation because P1 does not know this X2 at all. So what we can do, in the, in the proof of P1, we can replace X2 in the secret sharing by, by the value of zero. And therefore, we obtain a secret sharing, replicated secret sharing, which is used only in this proof where P1 knows all the shares. Now, once the randomness in the proof is chosen jointly by the parties, then basically the provers knows everything, and in particular, it will know what messages to expect in the proof. And so, if the proof is rejected, we can, ask, we can ask the prover to identify one of the verifiers as a cheater. And then the prover, together with this identified verifier, will be the new semi-corrupt pair. If the prover is, is corrupt, then obviously uh, we have a semi-corrupt pair. Otherwise, if the prover is honest, then we know that it can identify a corrupt verifier, and so again we have a semi-corrupt pair. So how do we use these two properties in our verification protocol to find a semi-corrupt pair? So let's go back to our verification protocol and go over it step by step. So in the first step, it's a local computation, nothing can go wrong. In the, in the second step, each party secret shares one value. So what can happen here is that a corrupted party will send inconsistent shares. But as we said, when we have inconsistency, we can identify a semi-corrupt pair. In the third step, what can happen is that the proof will be rejected. Again, as we, as we said before, when the proof is rejected, we can identify a semi-corrupt pair. In the last step, there are two events that can happen. First, uh, 
the corrupted parties may send incorrect shares for V. And again, we will have inconsistency, so we will be able to find the same corrupt pair. But there is another event where none of the previous events have happened, but still V does not equal to zero. And in this case, it is not clear what to do. However, we observe that if this happens, then we know that none of the parties cheated in the verification protocol itself, because all the shares were consistent, all the proofs were accepted, all the proofs uh, were accepted, and therefore we know that all the parties acted honestly in the verification protocol, and this means that if V does not equal to zero, then one of the triples must be incorrect, at least one of the triples. And, there, and so we can use it in the following way. So our verification, our verification protocol starts with M multiplication triples. The parties run the sub protocol to verify uh, these M multiplication triples. And then we have three events. The first event is that V equals zero. The parties accept the triples and they proceed with computation. The second event is that a semi-corrupt pair was found, as we've seen in the last slide, in the previous slide. In, the, in this case, the parties remove the pair and recompute the segment. The last event is that V does not equal to zero, but what the parties does, do not hold a semi-corrupt pair. In this case, we know that there exists at least one triple which is incorrect. And so what we will do is ask the parties to run a binary search. In this search, each time the parties run the verification pro protocol on a smaller set of triples. And we know that in this process, one of two things can happen. Either the parties will find the same corrupt pair, or that eventually the parties uh, will hold one triple which they know to be incorrect. In this case, uh, we can ask the parties to run a secure MPC protocol which looks into the transcript of the multiplication protocol to compute this triple and find a cheater. So this is how we find a semi-corrupt pair in our verification protocol. So now let's move to see how to remove the, this semi-corrupt pair. So when using a replicated secret sharing, this means that we want to move from a T plus one out of N secret sharing into a T out of N minus two secret sharing. In other words, before each share was held by T plus one parties, now we want each share to be held by T parties. So suppose PI and PJ are eliminated from the computation. So we go over all subsets of T plus one parties, and we have three cases. The first case is that, is that this uh, subset does not contain PI and PJ. The, the second case is that it contains one of them, and the third case is that it contains both of them. So in the first case, we have more than T parties which remain active and no this share. So in this case, we don't need to take any action. In the second case, we have we remove one party, but still T active parties remain which know this share, and therefore again no action is needed. The third case is the problematic case. Here we have T plus one parties, we remove two parties, and then uh, only T minus one active parties remain which know this share. So here we need to take an action. So what we will do is we will give the share of this subset to some other party, PK, which is outside of this subset. The challenge here is of course, how will PK know that it, it, it uh, received the correct, share, the correct share. So here we use authentication tags, which allow PK to identify the correct share. And since we know that each share is held by at least one honest party, we know that PK will receive at least one correct share and he will be able to identify it using the authentication tag. So what are these authentication tags? So without going into the details, these are computed use, using this formula. We have one tag for all uh, the shares held by uh, each subset of T plus one parties. And we have authentication keys which are uh, held in, uh, which are secret shared across the parties and are expanded from seeds that are shared in an authenticated way. And the point here is that uh, these authentication tags are basically a result of a degree to computation and therefore we can use the same zero knowledge machinery as before to ensure that they are, that they are computed correctly. 
Now in the paper, we show how to further optimize this process until eventually uh, we can show that if we take into consideration the fact that in the future, less parties participate in the computation and therefore we have less communication, then taking into consideration this fact, we basically have a, a process to remove a semi corrupt pair which is almost communication free. Right, so we have seen how to find a semi corrupt pair. We have seen how to remove the, a semi corrupt pair once it was found. And these uh, things together allows us to uh, achieve full security. So let's summarize our protocol and analyze its communication cost. So the parties first compute a circuit C or a segment uh, C uh, with, a, with a private multiplication protocol. And here each party sends a constant number of, of elements per gate. Then the parties run the verification step. And in the worst case, if cheating took place, uh, they need to call log C times the verification sub protocol. And in each call, the number of elements per party is logarithmic in the size of the circuit. And the number of rounds is constant mm -hmm. using Fiat Shamir. There is also a constant number of calls to a broadcast channel, uh, which cannot be avoided in our honest majority setting. So overall, the amount of communication is linear in the size of the circuit plus as an additive term which is sublinear in the size of the circuit and the number of rounds is proportional to the depth of the circuit plus a, a term which is logarithmic in the size of the circuit. So with this I will end my talk. Uh, the full uh, version of the paper is on ePrint. Thank you very much for listening.